homology. So let me start by giving a brief introduction to quantum homology. Well, if we have a link L in S3, then the quantum homology is a, a bi-graded homology, and that is a link invariant. So let's say uh, if we choose R to be a commutative ring, then the quantum homology with the coefficient ring R is a bi-graded R module. R module. And it is a link invariant. And in this talk, I'll just take R to be z over 2. And it, it simplifies the argument a little bit. And also, it's, it's also a crucial condition in the statement of the main theorem. Now, well. The definition of quantum homology is actually completely combinatorial. Basically, what, what you do to define a quantum homology is that you, you look at a, a link invariant. So it's something like this. And now, what we can do here is that for each crossing, there are two ways to smooth out the crossings. So if we have a crossing that looks like this, then we can change that to something like that, or, or change it to something like this. So this is a, a local operation on the graph of the link. And these two crossings can actually be differentiated by the orientation of the background plane. If, if there's a fixed orientation of the background plane, then like, the first crossing and the second crossing can be described using this orientation. Usually, uh, people call this one the, the zero resolution and call this one the one resolution. And now if we have a diagram of the link with n crossings, then there are two to the nth uh, different ways to, re to resolve the crossings. And that will give us a two to the nth different diagrams. For example, in the, in the case of the hop link, there are four different ways, such as this. And that is the <coughs> that is 0, 0. And then we also have. one, this is the 1, 0. And similarly, there is also the 0, 1 crossing and the, and the 1, 1 crossing. So this is 0, 1. And then there is 1, 1 crossing. And for those crossings, uh, there's, a, there's a way to assign a chain complex out of, out of these crossings, such that there's an arrow between the diagrams whenever the diagrams are different, uh, are only different on, at one crossings, and in the crossings, the crossing label changes from 0 to 1. A and moreover, well, for, for each component in the, in the resolved diagram, well, what Kholanov did was that they assigned a, a two dimensional R module for each component, a and then after some, some algebra and some combinatorics, he, he was able to prove that the, 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 the resulting homology group is actually a, a link invariant. I'm not going to get, get to the details, because it's, it's kind of technical. But the, the point is that it's a com completely combinatorial construction. And it comes with two gradings. One of the gradings is kind of obvious. It's just a homology grading. And the other grading is actually comes from counting the number of components in the diagram. So that, that gives the other grading. And that's sometimes called the quantum grading or the Q grading. Now, one of the basic properties of, of Holanov homology is that if we take its Euler characteristics with respect to the homology grading, then it actually recovers the Jones polynomial. So let me write it down. The Euler characteristics characteristics of Holanov homology equals the R reduced Jones polynomial. And sometimes this polynomial is denoted by something like J of L. It's a polynomial that's also a link invariant. And one of the properties of Jones polynomial is that if you plug in, if you plug in the value at t equals 1, with t being the variable of the polynomial, then the Jones polynomial is actually always equal to the value of the Jones polynomial at the value 1 is always equal to 2 to the nth, where n is the number of components. So that immediately proves 
that the rank of quantum of homology is always greater than or equal to 2 to the n. And that gives a lower bound for the rank of the quantum of homology. Well, although in the definition of quantum of homology, we actually uh, need this L to be oriented. But it turns out that the rank of the quantum homology does not depend on the orientation. If we change the orientation of some of the components of the link, then it only shifts the, H, H, the, the, the two gradings, but it doesn't change the rank. So when we talk about the rank of the quantum homology, we can actually talk about the rank of, a, of the quantum homology of an unreduced, of an unoriented link. Now, the previous observation proved that the rank of the Hahn of homology is at least 2 to the n. But the, a natural question is, what are the links that realizes this lower bound? Well, one of the obvious examples is that actually the trivial link always achieves this lower bound. So if we consider L to be something like this, which is a trivial link, then the lower bound is achieved. However, as it turns out, the trivial link is not the only case that the lower bound is, is achieved. And one of the and the first example is that when n equals two, if we consider the Hopf link, this this thing, and it can be easily computed that the Hopf link has quantum homology with rank four which equals 2 to squared. So that is another example that the lower bound can be achieved. And because there's a, some kind of coolness formula for connected sums of links and disjoint unions of links, so from those two examples, uh, we can show that actually all the possible connected sums of half links and, and uh, trivial, trivial links and or disjoint unions of them will always achieve the lower bound. So for example, we can take we can draw a link that looks like this. But something like this is a connected sum of two half links, and that also achieves the lower bound on the rank of quantum homology. And in the case of three half links, there are actually two different versions of connect sums. So we could either connect sum this way, or we could connect sum this way. And both of them are connected sums of three half links, and both of them achieve the lower bound on the rank of quantum homology. Well, in fact, all such links can be described very nicely in terms of graph theory. Because whenever we have a link that's given by the connected sums and distinct unions of half links and, and on links, then it can actually be uniquely uh, determined by the linking numbers between the components. So for every link that looks like that, we can build a graph such that for every vertex is given by components of the link. And there, there's an edge between those two vertices if the linking number of the corresponding components is, is non-zero. So edge corresponds to. number being non-zero. And in that case, we can describe this link using a graph that has three vertices and looks like this. And this link is described by that graph. And this link is described by this graph. And more generally, whenever we have a graph that does not have any cycle, then it corresponds, it uniquely specifies a link that uh, is given by the connected sums and distinct unions of half links and on links. Well, for graphs without cycle, actually, there's a there's a name for such graphs in graph theory. So usually, people call them a forest, and this is just means a graph without a cycle without cycle. And therefore, uh, in some of the papers in quantum homology, this kind of links are also sometimes called the forest of all knots. 
And as we have discussed previously, all the four Stefan nodes achieve the lower bound on the rank of quantum homology. And there's a question asked by Batson Seed. That is, well, are they all the examples where a link can achieve this lower bound? So if the rank of the quantum homology of LZ over 2 equals 2 to the n, then is L always a forest of all knots. And the result that I would like to present today is that the answer to this question is affirmative. In fact, this is our theorem. ECA at 2019. And this is says that the answer is positive. Well, before I move on to the to discuss the proof of the theorem, uh, I should also give a historical review of classification or de uh, detection results of quantum homology. Uh, actually, the detection properties of quantum homology has already been studied actively for decades. And the first breakthrough was this, uh, the landmark paper by Kroheimer and Morovka. So well, let me, let me just write down a little bit of history. So the first breakthrough in the direction of detection properties of quantum homology was obtained by Kroheimer and Morovka, which states that quantum uh, homology detects the on knot And that can be kind of understood as, a, as the n equals 1 case for, this, for, for our theorem, where it, it, what they proved was that for a knot, in other words, a link with one component, if the rank of the quantum homology equals 2, then it has to be an knot And then there was the result by Hayden Nee, which was later improved by Batson Seed. And it states that the quantum homology, together with the bi-grading, detects the on-link, or the trivial link. As we have seen from the examples of four of announced Actually, the rank of the quantum homology cannot detect the, the on-link, but it turns out that the rank of the quantum homology together with its bi grading can detect the on-link. Uh, uh -huh. does, um, does the quantum homology with bi grading distinguish forests of on-links? That's a great question. Uh, the answer is no. It distinguishes the on-link with the other forests of on but in general, the bi grading only gives us the the number of vertices in each connected component. So we can recover the number of vertices in each, connect, uh, each connected component and the number of components from the bi-grading. Uh, but in general, it doesn't. Uh, for example, it doesn't distinguish this, this link with that link. Is there, are there some other coefficients or some other structures that can distinguish them? Uh, not that we know of. Well, you can use the linking number to distinguish them. I guess so probably that's a. The, by itself does not distinguish it doesn't. No, the, the, the quantum homology, and actually you can also ask, uh, there are some extra algebraic structures in quantum homology, it's called the module structure. Uh, the mo even the module structure does not distinguish all the for, uh, the, the force of all knots. Okay. Yeah. Right, so that, that was the result by Hayden, Neal, and Boston Seed, and later there was uh, a result by Baldwin and Sivak. where they prove that quantum homology detects trefoil. And later, Baldwin, Sivak, Xie proved that quantum homology detects the hop link. And more recently, there's a result by Nathan Dolling 
and on others where uh, they're and I think I think they're still writing it down and they prove that quantum homology detects uh, figure eight. And from, from a historic point of view, our result on the classification of links with minimal quantum homology can be thought of as a generalization of the on-link detection property and the hop-link detection property. Because basically, uh, what their original statement says uh, it was that if you have a link whose quantum homology is the same as the on-link or the hop-link as a bi-graded bi R module, then you can detect the link. But our result says that you, actually, if you only look at the rank, you already know that it's a forest of on-link. And then it's pretty straightforward to compute the grading to differentiate whether or not it's an on-link or half-link. So that was some historical discussion. And now let me talk about this proof. The proof of the, the classification result depends on the tools in gauge theory. And in particular, we'll make use of the singular instant of floor homology developed by Korhammer and Morovka. So singular Well, the singular instant of floor homology is, is a package that assigns a homo homological invariant to a link in a three manifold. So the package says, if y is a closed-oriented three-manifold, and let's say L in y is a link. And for, for experts in gauge theory, you'll probably remember that you, usually we need to take, to, to, to take some effort to avoid reducible connections so that everything will work. And in this case, what Kohammer and Morovka did was that they took a homology class, so a, omega is a homology class in H1 YL with coefficient 0 over 2. That stands for uh, sorry, H, uh, H, yeah, H1 Y. Uh, and and the, the Poincaré dual of omega is the second Schiffer-Huynh class of the certain SO3 bundle that's going to be considered using the, the techniques in gauge theory. And in this case, in order for things to work, we have to make sure that there's some technical condition that applies to, to the triple Y, L, and omega. And that is called an admissibility condition. So this triple is called admissible if if one of the following holds. One, there exists a sigma in Y closed surface such that the intersection number of sigma and L is odd. Or there exists a sigma in Y, still a closed surface, but disjoint from L. Such that uh, the intersection number of omega and sigma is odd. Because if omega is a, is a first homology class, we can define its intersection number with closed surfaces. And the package of instant floor homology tells us that whenever we have an admissible triple, we can assign a floor homology groups for this triple. So we have the so-called singular instant floor homology that is usually denoted by I of the triple Y L omega.
And the definition of the singular incident for homology works like we, we think of y as some kind of a orbifold with singularity at L and the structure group at the singularity being 0 over 2. And in this case, we consider an SO3 orbifold bundle over y, whose second schiedel quinet class is the dual of omega, and then study the instant floor homology, like the, the, the gradient flow of the chern simons function on that. The admissibility condition over there guarantees that uh, there's no reducible solutions, and therefore everything works nicely, and there's a, there's, there's a floor homology theory that one can develop from, from the standard like, floor, floor theory technique. The singular instant floor homology has a few nice properties. Uh, first of all, it's actually a, a relatively Z4 graded homology group. And it has nice functoriality properties. So if you have like y1, l1, omega1, and suppose there's another pair, another triple y2, l2, omega2, and suppose there's a cobordism that relates those two, th those two triples, then it induces a map from the first one to the second one. And there's a map y1, l1, omega1 to y, y2, l2, omega2. Well, the map is only well defined in general up to a plus minus sign. But the sign can be fixed if there's some kind of complex structure over the manifold, or over the cobordisms. And this map has a nice functoriality property in the sense that if you compose uh, two cobordisms, then, well, up to a constant factor of, of some powers of two, then the composition map is the same as the map induced by the composition cobordism. So it has a, it's, it's almost a functor from the space, the, the, from the, the, the category of, tri of admissible triples to the category of, of, of groups over the commutative ring R. And one of the properties of the singular instant of floor homology is that it behaves nicely under excision operations. Actually, this was the in the non-singular case, this, this was the property that was already observed by Flora himself. So let me just write it as an excision, excision formula. And the first version was origin due to Flora. And Flora only considered a case where L is empty, but actually the, the proof is exactly the same if L is not empty. So let me just state the floor's excision formula, assuming that L is also uh, allowed to be non-empty. And the, the statement is as follows. If we have a triple y L omega, and then let's suppose we have two tori inside the three-manifold y. So let's say we have t1, t2 in y. And moreover, we assume that those two tori, they are disjoint from L. And we need another technical assumption that we need intersection of omega and t1 and the intersection of omega and t2 are both odd. Well, in this case, uh, and we assume that t1 and t2 so are destroyed. In this case, it is possible to apply an excision process on the triple y l omega so that we can obtain a new triple. And the triple is given as follows. We can we, we fix a diffeomorphism from t1 to t2. And after fixing this diffeomorphism, it is, uh, one can cut y open along t1, t2. So there will be four resulting torus boundaries after this cutting. And then we glue the boundaries obtained from t1 to the boundaries obtained from t2 using the diffeomorphism phi. 
And the picture looks something like this. Um, so let me draw a low dimensional picture. So if we conduct a similar excision on surfaces, then the resulting manifold will look like this. So we cut them open, and then after gluing, it, it will look like, like that, like two components. So in, in dimension two, this is what an excision process looks like. And we can define something similar along tori in dimension three. Well, yes, yes. We need them to be co-oriented. Yeah, there's, well, the only thing we need to do is that to make sure that the resulting manifold has still has an orientation that agrees with the original orientation. No, but and you, you thicken it and you get two boundaries from each torus, and then you got to know which one you glue to which one. That, that's right, but that actually, uh, so, which one glues to which one is actually kind of uniquely determined by the orientation. Yeah, you're right. So we can, you can fix the co-orientation, and then that, that will tell you which one to which one. And actually, in practice, it doesn't really matter. So the, the formula actually works for, for all the cases. Uh, so so any, any way that, you, that, that we glue, as long as the resulting manifold is still oriented, uh, the, the formula still works. So anyway, so after the excision, let's call so this excision. Let's give the resulting manifold a name. Let's call them y tilde, l tilde, omega tilde. And well, because the excision locus is disjoint from l, so l has, an, has a canonically defined image in the, after the excision. And it's also possible to find an image of omega in homology classes. Now, one of the ways to think about that is we can think of omega as being represented by a, by a one-dimensional manifold with boundary. And in that case, we may assume that the intersection numbers of omega and t1 and omega and t2 are, are exactly the same on the nodes. Well, we can always change the representative so that this holds. And then the resulting omega tilde is just uh, obtained by the resulting one manifold after the excision. Okay. And in that case, what Fleur proved was that the, the sorry, 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 say that again. Why could you assume that the intersection numbers are the same? Well, because we, we, we can change omega as long as it represents the same homology class. And if the, if the parity of the intersection number is the same, we can always change, change the representative so that the intersection number is actually the same on the nodes. And if you think of it this way, then maybe we, we can also require that phi uh, maps the intersection oh, to, to the intersection. Yeah, it's a Z -mo, Z -mo 2 color because it, it's, it, it's, it's the punker dual of the second trivial quinine class. So it, it lives in coefficients over 2. And in that case, the Fleur's excision formula tells us that actually such an operation does not change the isomorphism class of the instant of Fleur homology group. Oh, and by the way, um, so there's some subtlety about the coefficients of the group, uh, about, about the uh, homology groups. So for instant of Fleur homology group, it turns out that it's more convenient to look at C coefficients. So from now on, for instant of Fleur homology group, we'll only look at C coefficients. And it's related to Z over 2 coefficients using uh, the universal coefficients theorem. So th this result actually works better if we only look at C coefficients. Uh, I think that the, the statement is cleaner if we do C coefficients here. And later, what Kroheimer and Morovka proved was that this result can actually be generalized to high genus surfaces. So what we can do is that we can assume that sigma, that we have two surfaces, sigma 1 and sigma 2, that are disjoint, co-oriented, but not necessarily being tori. They can just be uh, genus G surfaces. And G, G needs to be greater than or equal to 1 in this case. And still, we have a diffeomorphism. Uh, and well, once we choose a diffeomorphism from sigma 1 to sigma 2, we can apply the excision process. But in that case, the incident for homology may not be, may not be invariant, actually. Uh, in this case, those two homology groups are, are not always the same. But there's a subgroup 
of the, the insulin flow homology group that is preserved under the excision property. And that is one of the eigenspaces of a mu map operator induced by sigma. So let me talk about the mu map first. It turns out that if we look at sigma i, this homology class is an element in H2 of y. And in gauge theory, there's a, there's a mu map that people can define that acts on homology groups. So it's, a, it's kind of a, a enhanced version of the Cobordism map that we define over there. So there's a mu map that we can define, and it acts on i, y, l, omega. What one can prove is that, and that is actually why it's more convenient to work with c coefficients, because in coefficient c, it's easier to talk about eigenvalues and eigenspaces. In, uh, because, because C is algebraic, algebraically closed. So what one can prove that is that in this, for this mu map, the eigenvalues is a subset of a sequence of integers. Well, it, uh, actually, the, the exact values of those integers kind of depend on a convention of mu maps. Some, some people like add uh, some coefficients, like 1 over 4 or like 2 times whatever to the mu map, and that would change the, the, the numbers. But in the, in the convention of kruheimer morovka the eigenvalues is a subset of negative 2g minus 2, negative 2g minus 4, and so on and so forth, up to 2g minus 2. So it's, they're all the even numbers between negative 2g minus 2 up to, 2G, uh, up to positive 2g minus 2. And what we're going to do here is that we're going to only take the eigenspace with top eigenvalue. So we make the definition that i, y, l, omega with respect to sigma as the eigenspace, or actually it's the generalized eigenspace, so in a case where this operator is not diagonalizable, we also take like everything. After the Jordan canonical form, we take everything with, with a diagonal term being, being the same number and consider it as a generalized eigenvector. So the generalized eigenspace with eigenvalue with eigenvalue 2g minus 2. In other words, this is the, the eigensp this is the subspace with top eigenvalue with respect to the mu map. And now, uh, well, for notational convenience, actually, if sigma is not connected, then we, we simply define the same notation as the intersection of all the components. So i, y, omega, sigma is defined to be the intersection of i, y, omega, sigma i. So And this is merely for notational convenience, so, so that the, the excision formula will look nicer. And now we can state the excision formula by Kronheimer and Morovka in a high genus case. Here. This excision formula tells us that, well, we have sigma 1, sigma 2 in the original manifold. And let's call it sigma And after the excision, we can call the, the image of sigma something like sigma tilde. And in that case, Kroheimer and Morovka's excision formula tells us that a subspace of the instant floor homology group is actually preserved after the excision. So this is the generalization of Fleur's original excision formula to the high genus case. Well, in order to prove our result on the classification of quantum homology with minimal rank, we need to further generalize this formula. So what we're going to do is that we'll allow sigma 1 and sigma 2 to intersect L in our formula. Uh -huh. Yes, exactly. That's how this is proved. And the isomorphism was... was exactly. Was the, the isomorphism is induced by the cobordism that's given by the... And, and here... 
yes, here is also induced by that cobordism map. Yes, that's right. Thank you very much. So the, the, the isomorphism is actually induced by a cobordism that's, that's given by the excision, pro the excision process. So what we are going to do is that, let me fix that. This is an excision formula. So that will allow sigma 1, sigma 2 to intersect L. Uh, but of course, they have to intersect transversely so that, that everything works nicely. So intersect L transversely. And similarly, we assume that those intersection numbers are the same. And here, we also need to assume that intersection numbers with L are the same. So that after excision, we still have a nice link. And well, actually, previously, this intersection number being odd is only there to require, uh, to, 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 uh, to guarantee the admissibility. And now, because sigma 1 and sigma 2 are allowed to intersect L, actually, a more natural condition is to require that the intersection number with L is odd instead of requiring the intersection number of omega being odd or even. And for technical reasons, we need to assume this number is greater than or equal to 3. Now, still, assume we have a diffeomorphism. But in this case, uh, OK, so this is sigma 1, this is sigma 2. And we assume that it preserves the intersection with omega, preserves the intersection with L. And then we get a, we get a map here. And we have to modify the definition of the eigenspace. In, in fact, well, in this case, if sigma 1, if sigma i is intersecting L, uh, and let's say, uh, let's give it a name. So let's say this, this number is equal to m. Then the eigenvalue, what we can prove, is that the eigenvalue is a subspace of all the odd numbers from 2g negative of 2g minus 2 plus n to positive 2g plus minus 2 plus n. And because m is odd, this is actually a sequence of odd numbers. Now, similarly, we modify the definition so that the eigenspace is with eigenvalue 2g minus 2 plus m instead of 2g minus 2, because now we have m intersection numbers. I will make the same definition. And then our excision formula states that after these modifications, this formula still holds. And well, how does this formula? Oh, so so that, that's the statement of our new excision formula. And now I'm going to talk about the, how this excision formula can help us understand the classification of links using the, the information from Holano homology. Well, there's actually a generalization of incidental floor homology and singular incidental floor homology to the so-called suture manifolds. And a most, like one of the simplest suture manifolds, uh, examples of suture manifolds is uh, it's like a surface cross I. So example, so if Sigma is a closed surface, closed oriented surface. Then, well, by definition, sigma cross i is a suture manifold. And in general, a suture manifold is basically just a three manifold with boundary, but the boundary needs to have some extra structures. So, for example, uh, another example is that if a manifold y equals, if, if the boundary is equal to sigma, is diffeomorphic to a string union of sigma, then y is also a sutured manifold.
And in general, the, the boundaries can have more complicated structures, and the definition is kind of technical. But this is kind of the, the main example that we're going to think about when we talk about instant for homogeneous Hutchinson manifold. And Kohammer and Morovka introduced a version of instant for homogeneous Hutchinson manifolds by basically just gluing the two boundaries and, and considering the instant for homology of the glued manifold. So what they define is that they have the sutured instant for homology of y. So let me only write down this special case. So if y is sigma destroyed unit sigma, then the sutured instant for homology is defined by we first take a quotient of y by closing up the two boundary components using a diffeomorphism from sigma to sigma. And then, uh, so let's say L is in y, omega is in h1, y L c over 2. Then, uh, well, for actually, uh, we don't even need an omega here. And let's just take omega to be, uh, to be the to be 0. Then y L. The sutured manifold is equal to the instant of floor homology of y after quotienting the boundary with respect to L and with respect to some suitably chosen omega to make sure that everything is admissible, then with respect to the image of sigma. Now, the excision formula is important here because without the excision formula, we don't even know that this sutured instant of floor homology is well defined. Because because in the definition, it didn't really specify which diffeomorphism we should choose to glue up the two boundaries of y. And be, but because of the excision formula, we know that the isomorphism class of the suture incident for homology is actually independent of the choice of diffeomorphism. Now that we have a, a generalized and extended excision formula, we can actually extend this result by allowing L to be a tangle instead of a link. So in this case, uh, we can actually generalize Kroheimer and Morovka's definition for sutured instant of homology to tangles such that uh, such that the intersection numbers are the same. So the intersection number of L with first copy of sigma is equal to the intersection number of L and the second copy of sigma. And then we can just define apply the same definition here. And the excision, the generalized singular excision formula guarantees that this is a well-defined uh, group for, uh, as an invariant for tangles. Tango means you can the boundary. Yeah, tangle means that uh, it can be a one-manifold with boundary, and, and the boundary, and the boundary like, it's, it's a properly embedded one-dimensional man, one manifold. Yeah, for suture manifold in general, you have to first uh, glue this suture manifold along with some, some standard pieces so that it becomes something like that, and then glue the boundary. So you have to first kill the sutures by, by gluing it with, with some other, other three manifolds. Uh, and and, and, you, and in, the actual, in the actual construction, we also have to prove that it also, uh, the, the final group is also independent of the, the auxiliary data coming from the, the other pieces. Well, as it turns out, that there's a there's a very nice property of this suture instant for homology. That is, uh, let me write it as a proposition. And again, these are this is a generalization of Kraheimer and Morovka's previous result for suture instant for homology without tangles. Uh, and that's here. First of all, if Let me write it this way. If y l is taught, well, that's another technical definition. But basically, taught means that its a, its boundary achieves the minimal genus in the 
with respect to the, or it achieves the minimum genus amount of homology class. So if this is taught, then we actually have a non vanishing theorem. Well, it's always non zero. And again, similar results was already proved if, if L is a link instead of a tangle by Kraham and Morovka. And if. It's a condition about pair y l, so it is minimizing. It's actually minimizing the order characteristics given by like the. It's the Thurston norm. It's, it's minimizing. It's minimizing this number instead of just two g minus two. So it's a, it's like a generalized okay. version of definition of Todd developed. By, and this kind of version of Todd was studied in a in a paper by Charlemagne, and where, where he he basically developed a, a, a suture hierarchy theory for Todd man, for for three manifold with tangles. And moreover, what we know is that if the if the suture instead of four homology has rank one, and if y l is a homology product, then y l equals the product of some surface times p one. So this is a this is similar to the fibration detection results of floor theory obtained from from other theories, and and it turns out that by combining these two results and using the spectral sequence from from quantum homology to instant of floor homology, we can show that a minimal quantum homology, did, like we, we can classify all the links with minimal quantum homology. So let me, oh, I have 10 more minutes, so let me use the rest of the time to give a sketch of the proof of the main theorem. Well, in the case when n equals 1, this is actually done by Kraheimer and Morovka. But we can, in this case, we, we just cite their results directly. And in general, there's actually a spectral sequence by Batson Seed, which states that so if L is the disjoint union of two links, then, well, if this is just a disjoint union, then where L2 and L1 and L2, they, if they don't link at the, with each other, then the quantum homology is just the tensor product of those two. But in general, uh, if L1 and L2 link with each other, uh, the quantum homology of L might be complicated. But it turns out that there's a rank inequality, which states that the rank of the quantum homology of L is greater than or equal to the rank of the quantum homology of L1 times the rank of the Hano homology of L2. Okay. And now, combining the case with n equals 1, which was proved by Kraheimer and Morovka, and this rank inequality, we immediately show that actually, even though we don't know what this link L is, actually every single component of L has to be trivial, bec because like, this rank inequality forces every single component to have a quantum homology of rank two, and which implies that they have to be trivial knots. Oh, sorry. And in general, well, for example, how can we prove the theorem if n equals two? Well. If n equals 2, then the previous argument shows that actually this link is a combination of two trivial knots. But their linking, their, their relative position can be kind of complicated. But still, we can, we can just take one of the knots. So let's say L equals k1 union k2 as two components of L. And we can draw, we can, we can, after isotopy, we can assume that the first knot is the, is the standard, is embedded in S3 in a standard way. And then we have a then we have a k2 
somewhere lies in S3 minus K1. And now what we're going to do is that we'll, we'll take, for example, we'll take a ciphered surface of sigma. So let sigma be a ciphered surface. K1, but instead of requiring sigma to minimize genus, we require sigma to minimize the value 2g minus 2 plus m, where m is the geometric intersection number of sigma and k2. And what we're going to do is that we can cut open the manifold S3 minus the neighborhood of K1 along sigma. Now, because we're assuming that sigma minimizes 2g minus 2 plus m, so actually by definition, it follows that the resulting manifold is a taut sutured manifold. The result is a taut. Future manifold. So immediately we know that the dimension of its singular incentive for homology is non-zero. But now we have to use some uh, a symmetry that appears with in the in the eigenvalues of incentive for homology. Actually, the mu map is actually a relatively uh, the mu map actually has relative grading two, while the incentive for homology has relative grading. Is relatively z over four gradient, which kind of implies that the the dimension of the eigenspace of a, of eigenvalue k has to be equal to the dimension of eigenspace of eigenvalue negative k. So the eigens the eigenvalues actually has a symmetry because of the gradients. It actually follows from a, a conjugation some kind of conjugation map that you can basically just map eigenvalues, uh, map the eigenspace with eigenvalue k to the eigenspace with eigenvalue negative k by flipping some of the signs of, of the of, at different gradings. So which means that, well, this suture instance of floor homology at grading 2g minus 2 plus m is non-trivial. So the same instance of floor homology at grading negative 2g minus 2 plus m at, at this eigenvalue also has to be non-trivial. But recall that we're assuming that the Hohen of homology has rank 4, which means that by Kroheimer and Morovka spectral sequence, the incident of world homology only has rank, total rank 2. And now we already have, like, when g and m is large, uh, these two are different gradings. And in that case, we already have two different gradings where they're non-vanishing. And if the total rank is 2, that means that both the gradings have to achieve, have rank 1. And now that if they have rank 1, the Vibration detection results implies that it actually has to be an actual product, which basically means that K2 has to be a braid in the, in the complement of K1. So in conclusion, what we can write down is by previous arguments, We have either 2g minus 2 plus m equals 0, or uh, 2g, yeah, 2g minus 2 plus m it actually is, is less than or equal to 0, uh, or like k2 is a braid in the complement of s3 minus k1. And now we just separate it into several cases. So, well, first of all, if 2g plus 2 minus m is less than or equal to 0, that means we could have, uh, let's say we could have g equals 0 and, and m equals, oh, sorry, there's a, so actually this is, 
sorry, give me a second. So there's some technical issues here uh, that I'm not going to explain. But instead of having 2g minus 2 here, this is actually a 2g itself, because uh, there's an extra 2 that comes from introducing some extra extra components to the tangle in the definition of situation incident for homology. So here, in the definition here, we actually have to introduce some auxiliary components for L to make everything work. And that increases this value by 2. So it's actually 2g plus m instead of 2g plus m minus 2. So here is 2g plus m here. So if 2g plus m is less than or equal to 0, then obviously g equals 0, m equals 0, which means k1 bonds a disk that is disjoint from k2. And therefore, the two components are just separated. So L is the onlink. Now, in the other case, so here, in the other case, well, we can't really say anything yet. But we know that k2 is a braid in S3 minus k1. But actually, k1 and k2 are symmetric. So we can actually also conclude that k1 is a braid in S3 minus k2. And then by applying a combinatorial argument, the fact that k2 and k1 are mutually braided and that the quantum homology has a rank 4 already, include, already implies that the linking number uh, has to be 1. So here, using combinatorics, we can conclude that in this case, we have linking number equals 1. And now if the linking number is 1, obviously, the link has to be half link because we already proved that they, they're mutually braided. So this implies that L is a half link. And the general case is. Uh, it's basically a more complicated version of this argument. So first, we have to show that the linking numbers are right. And actually, this follows from an induction argument using the button seed spectral sequence. And then after the linking number is right, then a similar argument by playing around with eigenspaces and using the, the tautness and, and braid detection property, uh, one can show that then the link has to be a forest of onlinks, a forest of onnots. So I think I'll end here. Thank you very much. <laughs>